right. Thank you all for being here tonight. Another church history class. You guys are sticking it out. I appreciate that. Let's start off with a prayer and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this week. We thank you for the holiday at the end of the week. Lord, I pray that we have blessed time with our family and our friends and just whoever we're able to come in contact with um, this Thanksgiving. Lord, I pray that you are in the center of all that we do and all that we say and all that we are. And Lord, I ask you to be with each person who is here tonight. I ask you to give them open minds and eager e- an eagerness to learn. And Lord, I pray that you would just bless those who can't be here tonight for whatever reason. Lord, that you would allow them to join us um, as soon as possible. And Lord, we just thank you for what you've already done. And Lord, we look forward to what you're going to continue to do with this class. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. 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 All right, so before we get started today, I, um, it was, I'm sorry? There's a couple, uh, I guess just one person, yeah. Um, They haven't been real consistent, so. Um, So, before we get started on the actual lecture, I have a correction to to give you. Um, One of my very studious students here, that's live, um, pointed out that I was saying this term wrong. Remember we were talking about the Nicene Creed at the end of the lecture last week and how Eastern Orthodoxy, so, so through these different um, ecumenical councils, um, things, slight changes were made to the creed and then a non-ecumenical council was called and this introduction of what's called not a phililoquy, I just made that up, apparently. I put extra L's in there and everything. But it's also not philoquy, which, or that, that's what we thought maybe it was when we were talking about it after a lecture last week. The two pronunciations I found for it were filioque and filioque. I don't know which one is correct or more correct, but just so you know, I did not pronounce that word correctly last week, and it is filioque or filioque, and it is the addition, it means and the Son, and it was put in when describing the Holy Spirit, it was given by the Father and the Son. So this um, filioque was added in, Eastern Orthodoxy does not recognize that, and the Western Church did, okay? All right, so that having been said, let's get into tonight's lecture. So we are going to be kind of bouncing around just a little bit. We did it a little bit last week, too, when we were talking about Eastern Orthodoxy, you know, where the Middle Ages covers, you know, several years, and so we're kind of moving through them, but not necessarily chronologically. So tonight, what I want to start with is Emperor Justinian. Um, You don't need to know this date for a test. It's just just so that you have a bearing, okay? Um, Emperor Justinian. Um, He was married to a former prostitute. Her name um, is Theodora, or was Theodora. Um, The people absolutely loved her. I mean, people really loved her. Um, Justinian and Theodora were basically co-emperors over the over the um, empire. Not officially. Justinian was the emperor, but she was a support and a sounding board and all of those things for him. So she was very involved with what was happening in the empire. Justinian, really like most of the emperors on some level, he really wanted to try to reunite the empire again. He just wanted everyone to get along and for everything to happen um, as a, as in unity. But the problem with Justinian's time was we've kind of hit on this before. Rome started to have these outside forces coming in on it. Okay? Yeah. Thank you. Um, Started having these outside, um, if it gets too hot, we can open them again. Um, These outside um, groups of people coming in and threatening to attack. We talked about it a little bit when we introduced Leo, talking about Attila the Hun and his Huns that came in, and we talked about the Vandals just a little bit, just mentioning it. But there were all of the, there were groups of people all around that not necessarily were coming in to take over the empire, but they they were just 
not Roman citizens. And some of those, like the Vandals and some of the other barbarians, they actually were coming in. So at this time in the empire, it's still a little bit unstable. There's lots of... of um, the threat of an attack, some of them are actual attacks. And so Justinian began to tax the people very, very, very harshly. The reason he was taxing was because he needed more money for, the, for his troops, for the weapons, for the food, for the outposts, for the this, for the that. He had this campaign to keep Rome safe and keep it being Rome and uh, uh, the Roman Empire, you know, intact. And so he just had to have funding. And the way that he chose to do that was by imposing heavy, heavy taxes on the citizens. And what was unique about this was he was imposing heavy taxes on the Roman citizens. And up to this point, give or take, Roman citizens were given a lot of... Um, you want to call it grace. There were a lot of a lot of laws that applied to non-Roman citizens that did not apply to Roman citizens. Okay, so whenever he began to actually tax the Rome, the citizens of Rome, that really freaked them out. They had never been taxed before, and they weren't just being slightly taxed. It was a pretty heavy burden, and so the people were not real pleased with the way that that. The government was was going at this time because of this heavy taxation. He also had a strict policy, and and lots of the emperors did this. If you do these certain things, it's it's certain death sort of proclamations. He had his own list. A lot of them had to do with um, mor morality, um, prostitution. Oddly enough, his wife was a former prostitute, but I guess former means that we can move forward with that, and um, adultery, um, homosexuality, other pagan beliefs, influences, um, Greek philosophy, just lots of things. It, this is not only what he would put you to death for, but just to give you an idea, he was interested in improving the morality of the nation. That's the point. All right, well, like I said, the people were not at all impressed with what was happening. Um, they still loved his wife a lot, but they, were, they weren't really super pleased with him because of um, the burden he was placing on them. He was even, <laughs> I read in one, I don't, I don't really know, I've only read it in one place, so I'll take it for what it's worth, but I read that um, he was even taxing so, so people were dying. You know, people were dying of starvation, uh, not epidemically, but people who couldn't pay the taxes or couldn't do this, couldn't do that. Maybe people who couldn't work. They they were starting to to starve to death, and and they were being overworked, and just just all of these um, really horrible conditions. And so, for example, I read that if um, so, let's just say you and I are neighbors. Um, and you, you've just been worked and taxed and, you know, whatever, and you, you just couldn't take it anymore, and you passed away because you just, you just couldn't handle it. Well, I have to pay your taxes for you because I'm your neighbor. Wow. Well, what? Right? So he was, he was even having the dead pay taxes through the living. So it, it wasn't universal. I, I mean, and like I said, I only read it in one source. So, you know, maybe. Don't move next door to me. Right. <laughs> well, don't die. No, I'm just kidding. All right. So anyway, so there was just kind of a general mayhem. There was this imposing, like, sort of in the ether threat on the empire. Um, heavy taxes, heavy burdens. People didn't have money to buy food. You know, just, just it was just not a good thing. Well, in 532, the people had, the people had had, uh, just about all they could they could take. Um, so they began to protest. They began to um, relay to the emperor their displeasure in the way that things were being done. Well, it's going to sound familiar to you. Um, so what Justinian did was he built this huge hippodrome. A hippodrome is just like this long, circular, they used to do chariot races and stuff like that, a real big um, kind of amphitheater sort of thing, only without the ampha part. Anyway, and um, he, he built this hippodrome, and it housed or could hold about 100,000 people. So he built this hippodrome, and he used this hippodrome 
as a place once the people started to kind of kind of uprise, just you know, kind of protest. He called basically a meeting. Everybody into the hippodrome and we're gonna we're gonna have a discussion, whatever. Well, he gets everybody into the hippodrome, shuts the doors, and lets loose with his gladiators and takes out about thirty thousand people. Thirty thousand people, which is a uh, pretty powerful, even for old Theodosius, does that remind you of Theodosius and his Thessalonica business that he pulled? Very, very similar. But um, Justinian just kind of lost his, lost his composure and, and killed 30,000 people. Well, um, now the people are really upset. You've got, I mean, people are now to the point where, for example, the mind frame could be that if I'm going to die anyway, <laughs> if you're going to kill me anyway because I'm not happy, then I might as well tell you how unhappy I really am. You know, and so people started to rebel a little bit, could have been in, the, in a way like, I'm, I won't pay that tax. I won't go and work in that weapons factory, which of course they didn't have, but you know what I mean. Just, just people started really saying enough is enough, right? Even after this big, um, this Nika riot, as they call it. Pardon me? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, to appease the people, he because again, he's trying to unite the empire. He's trying to to ward off all the people who are trying to come in and get him, and he's trying to build the empire and keep it safe. And wants Christianity still to be part of that unifying factor. So, what he does is is he decides to build. Um, what at that time was known as the, was the largest church, and he called it the Church of Wisdom. He built this church to try to appease the people so that they would basically not forget about the Nika riots, but just refocus their, their, um, refocus their attention onto something that's more positive. That was basically the idea. This, he hired two mathematicians to engineer and build this church. It is a series of arches. It has a dome on the top of it that appears to be suspended whenever you see it in, at certain angles. Um, they, the first attempt to build this church, the, the dome part was a little bit too flat and the physics didn't make sense and it kind of fell in on itself, but they raised that, um, and there's a whole history behind that. You can, it's very interesting to read just the history of these mathematicians and what they did and how they figured things out and whatever. Anyway, um, and um, anyway, they, they ended up building this church, and they built it to honor Christ and take the focus off the Nika riots, but also to be the largest structure for, for, um, for Christianity, and it remained the, lar the largest structure for, I don't know, 100 years or so. It, it, was, uh, the, it was a big undertaking. This Church of the Wisdom was built in Constantinople, and it's known as the Hagia Sophia. Okay. The Hagia Sophia is still standing, which is remarkable given that it was, you know, built in the 6th century. It's still standing. And um, it is no longer an Eastern Orthodox church. Um, we're going to learn about this later on, but the invasion of the, the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, when they took over Constantinople, um, they took over the Hagia Sophia. And today, I, I actually don't know if it's a practicing mosque, like where you actually go to have service, or if it is just a museum. It is definitely a museum, but when I read about it, it's sort of like mosque slash museum. So I'm not really sure how that works, if it is a true mosque, or if it's more uh, of a touristy situation. But it's still standing. And um, it seems like, did Anthony see the Hagia Sophia? You know I, that I think he did. Because I was going to ask you, because um, I think that's where, one of the places that they went. When they I'm pretty there. sure it is too, so I think he's seen it. Um, in the in the flesh, but anyway, so so that is where the Hagia Sophia. This is an important thing for you to know. Um, just 
that it it began as an Eastern Orthodoxy sort of situation, and it it's it's not really a functioning church anymore. But it is a famous, very very famous um, structure. All right, so. We know a little bit about Justinian. Now I'm going to kind of pop over and I want to talk about, this is one of the main people we're going to discuss tonight, Gregory the Great. All right. Gregory the Great, he was raised in a wealthy family. Um, he was well educated. I mean, they, were, they had the money to educate him and they did. His dad was not a believer. He was secular and he was in government. You know, he was in politics, so to speak. He was like the mayor of the city. At about 33 years old, um, Gregory was given the position of prefect of Rome. That's just uh, a position of, like, not quite as high as the mayor, but, um, but anyway, it's a government um, title. Um, it lasted for a few years, um, but within, within a few years, he actually stepped down from, from this position, which I'm sure upset his dad, up, um, stepped down from this position and decided to enter a monastery, and he became a Benedictine monk, okay? Um, the Pope, we're, we're going to, which Pope it is doesn't matter. It, it, ha it is um, Pope Pelagius II. It doesn't really matter. Um, but anyway, the Pope, at the time that we're going to focus on, he, he takes an interest in Gregory in that he makes him a um, ambassador and sends him to Constantinople to represent the church with the various matters that are going on there. Um, he did a very good job. He was there for several years, and upon his return, um, well, he, he came back I'm not sure if he came back because his, his father died or if he came back and then his father died. But his father passed away um, once he was back. And he ended up building about seven monasteries in the area. Okay? So he was very prolific. And he was definitely a leader within the Benedictine um, monastery movement. All right. In about 585... He was made an abbot of St. Andrew's Monastery. He loved being the abbot. According to some of the things I've read, it was the happiest time that he had in his life was being the abbot over this monastery. He really just took to it and, um, and really, really enjoyed it. All right, so there's a little background about Gregory the Great. Now, in... Did I write it down? Yes. In 541 to 542, a plague broke out across the empire. Interestingly enough, it's named the Justinian Plague because of how the people felt. They felt like he caused, you know, we, we've kind of touched on these things before where um, the, the pagans blamed the Christians for fill in the blank because they were not honoring the pagan gods, right? Nero blamed the Christians for, you know, causing uprisings in Rome and, and blamed the fire that presumably he set. I don't know if he said it or not. But anyway, there's just this idea at this time that if you're not following the God that you believe in, he's going to come in and, and do, do issue because the people, you can't control the people around you, right? So same, same sort of idea. Um, this plague broke out and, and the people not necessarily the Christians, not necessarily pagan, but the people, whatever that means. The people were like, oh my gosh, this is all Justinian's fault. He's taxing us too much. He's too mean. He's not really being a proper governor. And it's all his fault. And we're all, gonna, we're all being punished because he's not leading us correctly. And so they actually named the plague Justinian, <laughs> the Justinian plague. Okay, it was it was really an awful plague. People people were were dying in droves, and and that would be you know more of our scenario that I mentioned earlier. People were trying to survive it, but if they didn't, their neighbors were being taxed, or what, or if they were starving to death because they couldn't they couldn't keep up with the taxes. So so this Justinian plague breaks out. The Pope at this time, this Pelagius II. He is killed, or not killed. The, 
the, he gets infected by the plague and the plague kills him. Okay? He dies from the plague. Um, the, the Pope that is in power at this time. It's, it's Pelagius, but I mean, and actually, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but in the back of your book, in the very back, there is a list of the Popes. So if you, if you wanted to make some connections, there's a whole list of them. Anyway, so whenever the Pope that is in power at this time passes away because of the plague, Gregory, who is well known throughout at least the Benedictine monasteries, he is chosen, and I have in quotes here, he was elected to take over as Pope. Well, uh, Gregory is hilarious, and he had, he, he did not by any stretch want to be um, the Pope, not at all. He didn't, he didn't want the authority, he didn't want the power, he didn't want anything to do with it. So his response to their election, he ran out. He ran away and went into the woods. Their response to him running out, went and dragged him back in. Because that's, that's what happened back then. You just, uh, apparently when you're elected in, that's, that's what that means. So, I know, it's pretty crazy. So now, suddenly, Gregory is the Pope. All right? Now, about this time, one of these people groups, the Lombards, and if you, if you look up, if you Google um, maps um, of mi uh, the Middle Ages and put in um, Gregory the Great or you know any of these people and you actually go to the images, you'll see um, different maps depending on the era, the, the years that you're looking at, where the Lombards lived and the Franks lived and, all, and the Ossogoths and all this stuff. We're not going to get into all of those people groups and who they are and what they did, but but what is important for this story about Gregory the Great is the Lombards came in and they took control of a large piece of land that actually belonged to the church. Okay? Actually belonged to the church. Well, Gregory is in power when this happens, and so he has to figure out what to do. And it's interesting. He's, he, again, is not necessarily interested in... in the position that he's in, but he's exceptionally interested in the people and in Christianity and, and morality, right? So when the Lombards come in and they take over this area, um, he establishes a welfare system with two primary goals. One is to make sure that the people are fed, and the other is to make sure that the taxes that are required from the people are collected in a dignified way. I guess is the best way to put it. So there are taxes that the church imposed on the people and there were taxes that the government imposed on the people. When the Lombards came in, they had their own system of, you know, you need to pay us money because we now, we're your authority, right? So he set up a system to try to balance what was coming out from the people and what was going into the people. So make sure they get what they need to survive, but then they're also meeting their civic duty and paying the taxes that they need to pay. So it was an interesting thing. He also, so that's kind of like what, what I'm calling, he was a leader of what was left of, the Roman Empire is kind of spiraling, it, it doesn't last too much longer, but he is the, the religious leader of what is basically left of the Roman Empire, at least the Western Roman Empire, right? And, and so, especially in establishing this system, he has taken a position, much like the people with Justinian were like rebelling because of the way they were, they were being treated by him, the people saw what Gregory was doing for them and they rallied around him. They loved him. And he was, because he was not interested in overtaxing or, or in any way taking from the people more than what needed to be taken, they saw that and they, and they rallied around him. So the people were definitely behind him at this point. He also had ambassadors, so to speak, who went and negotiated with the Lombards. And they negotiated 
basically a peace, a way for the two to coexist. They would get what they needed, the people would get what they needed, and there wouldn't be you know, bloodshed and starvation and you know, all these things that could happen. So on some level, and again, I put this in kind of like air quotes, on some level, because Gregory was in the, right in the middle of negotiating peace with the Lombards, and I don't mean peace like we're taking the land back, I'm talking just coexistence, right? Because he was making that effort and being successful, he was successful with it, he also became somewhat of an imperial leader. He was able to do something that, especially in Rome's eyes, the Roman government was not able to do. The Roman government, and again, this is a very one-sided opinion. I mean, you have to realize that the people were being taxed heavily and whatever, but to the people, the empire wasn't really helping them all that much. Yes, they were keeping the the people from attacking and coming in and taking over the empire, but they were much more concerned with the fact that they're paying taxes for their deceased neighbors or or whatever, and now these new people are coming in and telling us what to do. And so they really felt on some level abandoned, which sounds familiar with Leo and what happened with him with the Huns and whatever. The Constantinople really, you know, I'm not sure where they were or what they were doing, but they certainly were not, you know, rallying around trying to help what was happening over here. Maybe they had their own issues, which, which they did. But, um, but anyway, he ended up taking... Without, without meaning to and without trying, he ended up taking a position of, of imperial power, with at least in the eyes of the people. And that's why I put quotes around it. He did not become the emperor of Rome. <laughs> but to the people, when Gregory did something or said something or whatever, they really rallied around him and supported him. Okay? So, bless you. Um, because of especially these negotiations and things like that that were happening that weren't necessarily church issues, but he was getting involved in them, he did such a good job that he was given the title of God's Council. It's spelled a little bit differently. And I think that they even, if I remember right, they may have put that on his um, tombstone like his, as part of his, uh, what is it called, the epi epitaph? Um, anyway, because, and largely, it was because of his negotiation. He was a, a good statesman and, um, and really had the best interests of the people um, in mind whenever he made decisions. So, one of the things that I need, I want to make sure that you know about um, Gregory the Great, he started out as a monk, right? He's the first monk to become Pope. Okay? Now, because he was a monk and because he valued um, this monastic lifestyle um, and the morality that came with it, he brought in people that he knew, just like any of us would whenever you take a position and you need support around you, the people he brought in to help him and support him and be his counselors were other monks. And so the church at this point was in, even though politically not really a great position, the empire was not in a good position, the church was in a fantastic position because they had a godly leader who surrounded himself with godly counsel, right? And so much of what Gregory did was um, quite successful. Um, he did also in doing this, again, for somebody that did not want the power or the authority, he ended up getting a lot of power and a lot of authority. Um, he kind of set a standard for um, what was expected out of the papacy to follow him. I mean, he, he set a new standard in caring for the people and negotiating imperialistically, and that desire, that's what the people wanted out of the papacy from that point forward, right? So he sort of started raising the bar and setting standards and doing things that he never meant to do. He was just doing what he thought was right. 
All right. Um, after his death, this is something else that you'll want to know. After his death, he was given the title... Oh, he was given this title, Gregory the Great, after his death. During his lifetime, he would have never allowed that title to be used for him because he, he admittedly, like he, in his writings, he talks about how he struggles with pride and has issues with pride and, and he spent his life combating that and doing whatever he could to break his pride down, he would have never allowed this title to be on him in his life. But in his death, because we're awesome, we gave him that title and and he's known as Gregory the Great. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's just ironic. Um, he actually called himself the servant of the servants of God. And do you remember um, when we were talking about the ecumenical patriarch, the person who ended up being the authority, the lead authority over the Eastern Orthodoxy Church, and he called himself the first among equals? It's, it's a lot the same. Gregory... He saw. He understood that he was in a, a position of what you might call ultimate authority, like he was at the top of the top of the chain. But he chose to see himself and to present himself as a servant to the servants of God. So a servant leadership position. Um, what he really wanted to do was unite the church again, just like the empire. The emperors wanted to reunite Rome. Gregory wanted the East and the West to come back together again. Um, he gave a tremendous amount of his own money to the poor. He gave a tremendous amount of his own money in alms to um, people on the street. He did not hoard or um, keep on any level wealth. The papacy itself had wealth. They owned land. They owned, you know, gardens and vegetables and, you know, things like that. They had wealth, but he himself, the wealth that he individually attained, he gave most of it away. Um, the book mentioned this. He wrote a book called um, Pastoral Care. We're not going to get into, any, in, into too much about that book, but it's one of his more famous or well-known books. Um, and it, it basically, this pastoral care is basically a description, his description of how church leaders are to govern the church, how they are to treat the people, to govern the church, to um, morally be, uh, keep everything together. All right? All right, so that's some of the, that, those are the really positive things about um, Gregory. And I guess depending on your, on your perspective, these are also positive, just, just kind of depends. There are a few things that started with Gregory that I think you should be aware, or not started. A lot of these concepts didn't necessarily like Gregory started them. He came up with them himself, and he, um, sorry, and he, um, but some of these ideas that we're going to talk about were already brewing throughout history with, within the church, and because of his position and how much the people loved him and all the good that he did, many of these positions still stand, okay? One of the things that he said is that clergy, um, should not marry. Okay? One of the things that he supported was that the bishop at Rome or the Pope um, is the ultimate authority. Meaning that if there's a dispute between the two churches and somebody has to be right, somebody has to make a decision, he's the ultimate authority that would make, the pastor at the Church of Rome is the ultimate authority. And this is all based in Peter. 
laying claim to Peter. Okay? Um, he elevated the Apocrypha and um, much of what is in the Apocrypha he, he believed was scripture and not history book. Okay? Um, some of those I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, sin and penance are liter linearly related. The bigger the sin, the greater the penance. The lesser the sin, the lesser the penance. Okay? Um, he also, um, let me make sure I spell it right. Oh, I already spelled it wrong. The doctrine of, or the, idea of purgatory he supported which means that there were three this is so glossing over but basically three uh, ways or three options that a person has it's not an option there are three roads a person can take upon death depending on their spiritual uh, place when they die, where they are spiritually when they die. If they are in very good standing, straight to heaven. If they're in very poor standing, straight to hell. If they are in uh, mediocre standing, you know, basically, and I'm making this up, this vernacular, but basically a good person, but at the time of death, maybe not doing something you should be doing or whatever. I don't know. That, I'm totally making that up. But that person, instead of going straight to heaven because they're not doing what they should do, but not going straight to hell because they're not that bad, they end up in this sort of holding tank called purgatory. Um, once in purgatory, the saints um, played a part in interceding for anyone who is in purgatory. Um, he believed that the sacrifice of the mass would shorten purgatory. So family members, if they would go to, if they would, and many times it was, it was um, purchased. They would um, purchase a mass for the benefit of a loved one who is in purgatory to shorten the time that they would have to spend there. Um, he encouraged um, veneration of holy, of holy rel relics. So it's interesting, at this time, veneration of holy relics was not looked at as being weird or blasphemous or sacrilegious. That evolved over time. But he was somebody who who believed in venerating, not worshiping, but venerating um, holy relics. All right, and the last thing that he believed in is something called, I think it's trans, right? Yes. Trans sub IAT uh oh, I already spelled it wrong. Sorry, hold on just a minute. Transubstantiation. This has to do with the um, this has to do with communion and the elements, the um, bread and wine, or um, the host and the wine. Um, tra transubstantiation says, or what this means is that the elements actually become the body of Christ and actually become the blood of Christ. And therefore, for example, if you were to drop or spill or in some way harm the element, then you are 
actually harming the actual body of Christ, the actual blood of Christ. It becomes very uh, intense and very dangerous. And um, many, from what I understand, this transubstantiation led to the place where only the priest or or the person overseeing the mass actually has control over the host and the wine because then they are responsible for what's happening. So if they drop all the host, they're responsible. Well, I, that's what I've read. I, I actually don't know if that's true in in all of the places that that apply to this. But um, but but yes, my understanding is is that whoever drops it. <laughs> Has some trouble, but again, I mean, I'm speaking. I'm. I am not speaking from a place of experience or even a place of vast research. So it may be that some of you either know or will research in the future and find out that some part of this is slightly askew. And um, but I'm. I'm giving you the giving you what I can. That's what I'm asking. So I've actually seen a priest during communion drop all the hosts. Yeah. Uh, Oops. Yeah, yeah. It just depends on if if they actually believe that it is because there's a point in the service which, of course, I have no idea what that point is. But there's a point in the service where it goes from being a wafer and wine to being, um, and and there's there's one. I think I think that if I understand right, consubstantiation is where once it's in your system, it changes. But transubstantiation, it happens somewhere outside of your system, but I don't know at what point. So hopefully, if that happened, it was prior to the, the change. I mean, no. Okay. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Because when you receive the host, it's already the body of Christ. Okay. Oh, so if he's... It's already, I see. It's already happened. Yes. So okay. Christ all over the floor. I yes. Oh, uh, yeah. He went up to take it. Um, he he took the communion and he was flipping it like a quarter on the way to his seat. You know, because he, because he didn't he didn't really know. Yeah, yeah that's that'll really get people upset. Oh, yeah. Depending on your depending on where you're coming from and what you're where you staring at it and I was like, Bop. yeah. <laughs> Oh no! Don't drop it. Wow. Yeah. So anyway, Gregory was a believer in all of these things. So one of Gregory's weaknesses, and this this would be a negative for sure. So yes. A believer, this is what he established. It's it is okay. You could say he established it. I just don't want you to think that these things did not exist in any way before he came on the scene. What he did was he had his belief system, and because of his position, and because of his authority, and how much people loved him, when he said this, people were like, oh yeah, totally, that's it. Do you know what I mean? He kind of, it's not so much that they're brand new concepts, but he definitely established them as, I guess, a great word, um, and, and made them... Yeah, he, he definitely made them something that people no longer wanted to ignore or be light about or whatever. So, um, his, um, his weakness, yes, his weakness is that he, um, he needed protection from the government. Now, protection. This is, this is just protection in general from maybe people coming in, from maybe people against the church. I mean, whatever. He just needed, in general, he needed protection. He was not a Roman centurion, right? And so in order to get that protection, he would, um, he would sometimes use the government. He would not quite quid pro quo. Not that. That's pretty um, underhanded. But he would... He would make arrangements, or he would make deals, or he would do this and that in order to have this. And if he knew, and this, I mean, are you, I hate saying after I've said he's such a great guy, but this is just this is just human nature. This is this is just human nature. He tended to, if you were if you were somebody like I'm Gregory, right? And I know that you are somebody who is going to give me something I need. We'll call it protection, right? Um, and 
I know that you are very wealthy, and I know that there's an overall tax going across everything. I may be a little bit lenient on how much I taxed you because we have an arrangement where you are helping me so that I can do my job. Mm-hmm. Not helping me get rich, not helping me keep money or hoard money, but just helping me so that I can do my job. And that ends up being um, a weakness of his that, that even though he was fairly good at keeping it under control, the people that followed him the authorities that followed in his footsteps, they were given the same privileges, right? Extended the same courtesies, but perhaps not with the same heart. And so those things were taken advantage of and those things, you know, so, um, so it was definitely a weakness in how he governed um, what he governed. All right. So that's Gregory. Um, he's very important, very, very much somebody you need to know. Um, know that he's the first monk to become po- pope. Um, understand this title and the fact that he didn't give it to himself, that it was given to him after death because he would have never allowed it. As a matter of fact, he got really upset with the Eastern Orthodox Church because of the titles that they were giving, you know, like this ecumenical patriarch. You know, I mean, he just did not, he was not down for any of it. He felt like all of that was a measure of pride that would, it would eventually cause the church to implode on itself. So he, he was very strong about it, not just for himself, but, but for other leaders. All right, so in the last few minutes, I just want to go through a few guys. I need like three or four of these whiteboards so I can have them all done by the time you get here and we can just talk about them so I don't have to spend time. Oh, the, oh my note. All right, the other thing I want you to know before we leave Gregory. I forgot about this. I'm glad I... Yeah. All right, this is something else I want you to know. Now that we have discussed um, most of these people, it will make more sense. I didn't want to give them to you until we at least talked about them a little bit. There are four men called the Four Latin Fathers... that I'd like you to know. Now, I'm not going to ask you things like, I'm not going to put on a test the four Latin fathers here and then what they did over here where you're going to have to match them up. I would like you to have some idea about who each of them are, but really what I want you to know is that these are the four Latin fathers, okay? One is Ambrose. Two is Augustine. Three is Jerome, and four is our friend Gregory. I do want you to know those. F- Jerome, he was the Jerome was the man who translated the Septuagint into Latin. He or the Vulgate. He is the author of that translation. Original author. All right. All right, I want to talk about three more men. They're all related to each other. That's an R. I'm just going to put them up here first, and then we'll talk about them. in the short, yes. Okay, so Charles Martel. So we're not going to get into too much history on him. Who we're really going to talk about is Charlemagne. But Charles Martel, he kind of starts this whole thing. There is a position that is created, a very powerful position um, that is created that's known as the mayor of the palace. He was the first person to have this position. He was, it was a lot of authority. We're not going to go into what it means or anything like that. It's just extreme influence in the kingdom, okay? Um, 
we, again, this is jumping way into the future, but whenever the Muslim invaders came in, Charles Martel, whenever they started coming in and encroaching, he was one of the primary people that stopped that invasion. Um, because of the way that he, that he was, both with his troops, especially with his troops, but just his personality in general, he was known as the hammer. And he was very successful at stopping the invasion of um, the Muslims into Europe. Because of his ability as a soldier and his position that, they, that he's been given, whenever he has his son, one of his sons, it's not his only, but one of his sons, Pippin the Short, Pippin the Short was also in the, a, a very strategic and um, excellent military leader. E-X-C-E-L-L-E-N-T. Can't talk and write at the same time. Now, he learned a lot from his dad. He had a lot of, you know, uh, expectation, but he also delivered. He was a very, very good military leader. Um, he was all, he, well, just so you know this, he was known as the King of the Franks. The Franks, I know that these terms are kind of um, foreign. The Lombards, the Franks, the Ossogoths, all of these are different, different populations that were situated around what, I mean, especially Rome, but around the western part of the empire. They were people that just lived on the outskirts, big populations of people. And eventually those people began to try to come in and take territory, much like they did with Gregory. And the Lombards come in and they take part of that, or they take control of part of the land. So he was the king of the Franks, another, another one of these groups. All right. Now... It's very interesting because the Lombards had invaded and they had taken over some of the um, some of the territory, but one city that they had taken over was the city of Ravenna, and that was the center of the Byzantine religious not not the Christian not the Christian church at Rome, but the Byzantine center of religion, this Ravenna, and it was devastating for the Lombards to come in and take over the city. Pepin came in, he, he was, the Pope at this time appealed to Pepin whenever Ravenna was taken over. And he says, Pepin, please come in, please get, get this city back for us, don't, don't, let, don't let these Lombards take the city or take it back from them. So he, he gets an appeal from the Pope and Pepin comes through, and he does. He totally takes the city back, and he um, takes this territory back. And instead of giving this territory to the empire, which is what was standard, he gave this territory to the church. Okay? This territory is known as the Papal States. The handout that I gave you earlier, it's just a little tiny um, nondescript because there's a million um, images out there and they have, you know, all the land divided up by the different people groups and all this stuff and I just didn't want to go there. But that's basically Italy. You can see the shoe. And that orange piece, that's the land that Pippin gave to the church. It was a very, it's like 1,800 square miles, oh, sorry. It's about like 1,800 square miles of, of land. It was a huge piece of land that he did not give to the empire, but he ended up giving to the church. It's called, this donation is called the donation of Pippin. I think the book talked about that. You're reading. Okay. Now, 
This donation did a couple of things. Not only, I mean, it gave land to the church, obviously, but it gave land to the church at Rome, right? So the, this donation of land inadvertently helped to further segregate and separate the Eastern Church from the Western Church, okay? Um, also, eventually, not at this particular time, not immediately, but eventually, this donation began to cause contention between the Pope and the Emperor. Anytime there's a big, huge piece of land that, or whatever, that is just freely given to somebody of authority, someone at some point is going to come up and come against that, that donation or that gift or that acquisition or whatever, and, and it just begins to cause, immediately it caused some problems because there, were already, there was already fighting between the, the churches. But eventually, where there was once harmony, so to speak, between the emperor and the Pope, eventually this becomes a point of contention between them. All right. So then we come to Charlemagne, which is the, we don't have very much time. I'm going to have to so then we come to Charlemagne. He is the main point of what I, the only reason I brought up Charles, oh, because Charlemagne is Pepin's son. So we have three generations here. Charlemagne um, comes on the scene. One of the things that he did is he confirmed that donation. So that makes, that leads me to believe that there was already some contention arising about it. I don't know what that contention is or who who was involved or even if it was involved. It's an assumption. I haven't, I haven't found anything to support that. It's just me talking up here. But Charlemagne came along behind his father and, um, and said, yes, definitely. He confirmed that that, that that land was given to the church and not to anybody else. Um, one of the things that Charlemagne did was he established something known as Christendom. You've heard, or I'm, some of you maybe have heard um, Pastor Khan talk about Christ Christendom. All right, so Christendom. It is a word that it describes the marriage between the church and the state, the pope and the emperor, okay? The original idea, starting with, I mean, even before, but with Gregory, since that's who we were talking about tonight, the original idea when working with the government was, not, was, was for, just for that. It was to work with the government for the good of the people. So to the church this idea of marriage between church and state to the church, it was to secure spiritual blessings on the people as a whole. To the state, it was to unite and safeguard the empire and to make sure and keep human welfare at a level where people are able to survive. So both church and both state, whenever they come into this marriage called Christendom, the initial, as it always seems to be, the initial idea about it is genuine and is good. Charlemagne <coughs> establishes this marriage. He works very closely and intimately with the, um, with the church. Because he basically was putting the two things together. He gave a lot of money to the church, a lot of support to the church, okay? Not to say that he was making the Pope wealthy, not, not in a bribery sort of way, but as almost like an act of faith. Like, I want the government and the church to work together on my part. We're going to support the church. We're going to give you what you need, right? So, um, Charlemagne believed in... Because he was not he was not a 
a authority of the church. He was an authority of the state or of the empire. His main goals were to have a strong military power, which makes sense because all these forces are all around the place, right? He wants a strong military presence. And he also wants a strong religious presence. He wants, he wants strength in the empire, and he wants strength in the souls of the people. He wants strength all the way around, fortified on both sides. Um, he wants this, this idea of Christendom, he wants it to, I wrote it down in a special way here, he wants it to be able to instruct both the minds of the people and the souls of the people. Okay? Um, Uh, um, Charlemagne was a big, 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 huge believer in education. This is one of the main contributions, just, uh, just on a secular note, one of the main contributions that he, that he gave to history. He saw education as being absolutely important for every citizen in Rome. He saw both, and this is interesting, not just the boys to be educated, but the women to be educated. Um, he himself was not an educated man, but he saw the value in education. And of course, at the time, you know, it just depends on the era that you're living in, but, you know, for the boys, that meant military and strategy and school and that kind of stuff. For the women, it was more like what society expects out of them, like how to behave, almost like an etiquette thing, but, but, to give them a place where they can learn and not just, I mean, if you are an orphan child and you have no one to learn from, he wanted to put things into place so that everyone would be able to learn what, at that time, a person should learn, right? Um, he was a he was a pretty godly man. He led a godly life. He did have a problem with women, as as many of the people throughout our history have has had. Um, he had five wives, four concubines, and many lovers. I don't know if that's all at the same time or not. Those are just statistics that I found. So I don't I have no idea how that how the order of that goes in throughout his life. It's just flat statistics. Um, let's see. So he was a very strong leader. He was, he was instrumental in this marriage between the church, or at least trying to marry the church and the state. It resulted in, an, uh, in a term that we still use today. And, and he, was, he was very successful. Whenever other people came after him, once he, was no, I th I, once he died and other people came and took his place, they were not those leaders were not as strong as he was, and the whole system that he had put into place began to degrade, and it degraded into what is known as the feudal system. And we'll talk about, we don't have time to talk about it tonight, but it, and I say degraded into, many people find the feudal system to be, so I probably shouldn't say degraded into, it changed from this marriage and mutual communication into more of a hierarchy of, okay, this, is, this person is responsible for this land, he has this person working under him, and that person is responsible for this region of that land, and, and it became a hierarchy of power instead of a mutual sharing of power, so to speak, okay? So he started something, but um, the people who followed him were not able to keep it up. And the feudal system, we'll talk a little, I think, did, was the chapters that you read, did it talk about the feudal system? Okay, then it's going to be in the next, one of the next two chapters. And um, the feudal system is, it's not, it's not that the system itself is, is a bad idea, it's just very corruptible. It's very easy to manipulate it and easy to take advantage of. So, um, especially whenever you are, when the, when the emperor is up here and then the other people it, that are part of this new feudal system are in charge of things, they're okay. No one's really watching them or what they're doing. And so they have certain expectations that they have to meet, but no one's really paying attention to how they're meeting them. You know what I mean? So it just, it just becomes something that can be 
um, abused. And it, it does end up being abused quite a bit. So, that's it. That is Charlemagne. All right. So, I know that was a lot. Yeah. All right. So, your homework for next week, I think, is probably the next two chapters. Where are we? The 20th? Chapters 19 and 20. So, um, this... We have, let's see, today's the 20th. We have one, two, three more weeks of lecture. And then on December 18th, that's our last meeting day before the break, before the two week off. It's the week before Christmas. That day we will have um, the, the a, <laughs> yes, it's a Christmas present. We'll have uh, exam number two. That's right. Exam number two. I don't think I want it. And, and just to make sure that everyone's staying on track, um, the um, Fox's Book of Martyrs, if you've had time to start reading it, that's great. If not, that's okay. But um, if you choose, I, yeah, I haven't started reading it either. I've got I've to get after it. Um, if you choose to do the assignment, that assignment is due um, the week we come back after the break. Okay. So, like six weeks from now, or something like that. Do you remember what the assignment is? Write a paper. Yes, one page opinion paper on the book. If you choose. Well, hey, I'm. I can't come to your house and tell you to write the paper. So, no, it's it's not an option. I mean, you're going to get graded. You're going to get graded for it, but you know, it's it's up to you whether you want to read it and whether or not you want to write the paper. That's. It's just like any other assignment. So. Um, but um, the only thing I ask is that when you write your opinion that it be more substantial than yes I liked it or no I didn't. I mean I'd, I'd like to have a I'd like to have a real response for um, for how you how you like the book. Yeah, yeah. And and an opinion cannot be wrong. So you can like it, you can dislike it. It doesn't. That's not what you're getting graded on. It's just giving me your opinion about the book. That's right. What you got out of it. Um, if you don't have a book, I can get you one tonight. So anyone who doesn't have the book yet. All right, I guess that's it, guys. Yeah. Only three minutes late tonight. <laughs>